one of the benefits of cryptocurrency, which could have prevented a lot of this, is the fact that you can self-custody your assets. You do not need to use a middleman. Really like the biggest aspect of cryptocurrency that really why it was created in the first place is that you don't need an intermediary to transact with. Global companies face unprecedented risks and challenges in today's economy. To mitigate these legal and economic risks, companies are rapidly embracing and elevating the importance of robust ethics and compliance programs to promote positive corporate citizenship. On Corruption, Crime and Compliance, you'll hear from industry leaders and insiders about how to create effective ethics and compliance programs that will mitigate risks and maximize financial performance. Here's your host, Michael Volkov. Well, it's great to have Matt Stankwitz, our cryptocurrency expert, here today to talk about the notorious case of SBF, as we call him, Sam Bankman Freed, who has sort of rocked the cryptocurrency world. And Matt, in response to his arrest, wrote a great series on the blog going through all of the sort of various legal issues, the implications to the cryptocurrency business and the industry and calls now for regulation. And then just to intro, just to give you a little bit of my thoughts on this before Matt starts uh, explaining more about the case. When you read some of the facts of the case so far, Bankman Freed, it just reads like a blatant embezzlement, stealing, white collar crime like we've seen through the last 200 years, where we have a bad actor who's able to raise tons of money and just takes the money and, and just uses it for whatever he or she wants without any semblance of control. So it's a really interesting case because it's in this new industry of cryptocurrency. So Matt, welcome. And we're glad to see you here. Surprised you're not bankrupt yourself after the uh, <laughs> Bankman Freed uh, scandals rocked the cryptocurrency industry. It's great to have you here to go through this, but what a case, what a set of facts. Yeah, it's pretty outrageous. And yeah, it's been, uh, it's been wild. It's, it's great to be here to speak about it. I'm not bankrupt yet, but maybe close. And that's why I'm still working here and haven't retired yet. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hopefully on the always, next bull run. But <laughs> We always make the joke when you're on, Matt, it's like now the second time on just to talk about crypto in the recent events. And we always talk about whether or not you're bankrupt or not. But it seems to me like you're doing quite well in the crypto industry. You know, you yourself may be in the long, long line of FTX consumers who are customers who are out money. I will admit I did lose a little money in this, a relatively small portion of my crypto holdings, but I was using one of his subsidiaries and even one of the other crypto exchanges that unfortunately fell in the domino effect afterwards. So maybe I'm biased. I figured I'd get that out right off the bat, but no, honestly, it's been a pretty shocking turn of events. It was really, it was really surprising for everyone in the industry because up until the point where they became illiquid, insolvent, everyone held FTX up as being the gold standard. So for a little background, for those that are still you know, learning about the case, FTX is a cryptocurrency exchange. They are actually based in the Bahamas, but they do have a U.S. subsidiary called FTX U.S., they have well over 100 subsidiaries all around the globe operating in a variety of jurisdictions, Japan, Malta, all throughout the European Union, UK. On there, you could trade different cryptocurrency assets. So you can deposit US dollars, buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, trade those for Dogecoin and Shiba Inu token and whatever else you want. They had virtually everything on there. A lot of their exchanges also offered a lot of different commodity products, derivatives, futures, swaps, options, things like that. And those were extremely popular. The peak daily trading volume on FTX at its height was over $20 billion. That is $20 billion okay. per day traded on the exchange, which is just an unfathomable number. And more so than Coinbase, more so than any other competitor. More than Coinbase, more than Coinbase by a wide margin. The only exchange that had more volume was Binance. Binance is the largest exchange by far. FTX is the only other exchange in that tier. And then everyone else is just was just looking up at them. Even if you weren't into crypto, you may have seen or heard about FTX over the last year or so. 
every MLB umpire has an FTX patch on their uniform. The Miami Heat Arena was renamed the FTX Arena. There was a Super Bowl commercial. You know, there's a very funny, popular commercial with Larry David. Like, you might remember that one because I know you're a big Larry David yeah. fan. Yeah, no, no, um, I do. And a variety of other celebrities that endorsed them, including Tom Brady, you know, his former wife, Giselle Bunchen, Steph Curry, Naomi Osaka, Trevor Lawrence, Shohei Otani, Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, the list just went on and on. They enlisted everyone. And they look to be the golden child of the industry. And I feel bad now because some of my friends had asked over the last year or two, hey, I'm interested in crypto. How should I get into it? Say, hey, Coinbase is one option. But you know what? FTX, another great option. They're... You know, if I was going to pick one exchange that would never go bust, it would be FTX. I remember saying those words. <laughs> wow. wow. And Matt, Matt, how, here we there, are. Was there any indication along the way on, before it fell apart, before the whole scheme fell apart? Were there warning signs? Honestly, no. And, you know, sometimes when these things happen, you can look back and say, like, oh, I really should have known because of X, Y, or Z. I don't see that here. And I don't know if it's just a great PR campaign by the company, which I think did play into it because, you know, they were really working hard at that. SBF was in front of Congress. It felt like monthly discussing about all the great things that he was doing to manage risk, to safeguard user funds, the cybersecurity things they were implementing to make sure it never got hacked and how everyone else in the industry should follow his lead. And it was all farce. It's amazing because, you know, you look back and it was just all an outrageous, complete lie. Can you explain a little bit, going back to the structure, because we mm -hmm. see this name in the indictment, we see this name throughout and in the headlines. What exactly was Alameda research in relation mm -hmm. to FTX? And then there's an issue, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit while, about the relationship of Alameda and priorities and controls related to Alameda's interactions with the FTX. Yeah, so Alameda research is really the key to all the issues here. So we talked about the FTX exchange side of things, and that's really what was most known to the public. On the side, there is also this company called Alameda Research. And Alameda Research was actually the first company that SBF founded. So he was the founder and he he owned about 90% of the company as of the time that it collapsed. Alameda Research is essentially a crypto hedge fund. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. The trading arm of SBF. So they initially worked on primarily arbitrage trades. So they buy Bitcoin from Japan where the price was lower, sell it in the U.S. where the price was higher. Very simple things like that, but they did it in such large quantities and made a lot of money. So they expanded past that by being a like venture capital arm. They were investing in a lot of different cryptocurrency projects. They were taking riskier and riskier trades. They were trading on margin, which means they were trading on loaned money, which is extremely high risk because if the, you know, you take out those loans with collateral and if the trades go against you, then you lose that collateral and you lose all your money. So at some point, Alameda began losing a lot of money probably by bad trades and just in general, the market was spiraling downwards. You know, the crypto market has pulled back close to 90%, 80-90% over the last year. So drastic downswing. And then maybe one of the most crazy things I've seen in cryptocurrency is their largest competitor, Binance, pulled some kind of Game of Thrones maneuver and forced a bank run on the exchange and mm. tanked the value of the FTX token. They had their own cryptocurrency that was tied to the health of the exchange. And they were using that token as collateral for a lot of these loans. So as the price began to drop based on a single tweet from the CEO of Binance, a lot of their a lot of the people that held these loans for Alameda began to call in the money and say, hey, you know, your collateral's too low now, you gotta pay back the loan. To pay back those loans, Alameda had no money on hand, so they began borrowing money from the exchange, essentially dipping into user deposits in the FTX exchange to pay back those loans. At some point, they dipped in too deep. There was a bank run on the exchange and FTX could no longer handle all the withdrawals that were coming in at once. And now with all that we know, all the information that has come out, it turns out that Alameda, again, was set up first. And it seems like right from the get-go, it was set up as a fraud to fund it was just essentially, they were using FTX as the personal wallet for these executives. 
So Alameda was giving personal loans to a lot of the executives. SBF himself had apparently taken out a $1 billion loan from Alameda, which was likely paid by user deposits. Several other executives took loans in the hundreds of millions of dollars. They were giving personal loans to their family members to buy lavish real estate and who knows what <laughs> with all that money. I mean, just throwing money around, living the high life in the Bahamas, and all it became really from you know user deposits. When I was reading some of the facts around it, or mm -hmm. allegations, if you want to call it that for right now, that the SBF was just dipping into these funds that were customer funds, using it in the Alameda business and to mm -hmm. cover losses there, and then also to stake money, hoping that he could make more money to pay off the debts that he already had. And it just, right. it just careened out of control quickly. And then we you have- You know, one of know, the big things is they, they just grew so outrageously fast. I mean, they were set up as a small business and they just never changed the basic controls that they had. You know, the guy who's handling the bankruptcy now just testified in front of Congress that this multi-billion dollar state-of-the-art corporation is still using QuickBooks as their accounting software. And Excel yeah, spreadsheets. like QuickBooks is great and all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're moving around $20 billion of assets per day, it, it can't handle that. You know, they had commingled bank accounts. A lot of user deposits were legitimately, and I mean this literally, at least according to the allegations, deposited straight into an Alameda-owned bank account. So they weren't even go they didn't even go to FTX. They went straight into the pocket of Alameda. There was no no delineation between those two companies. So we had no financial controls in place. We also had a a priority given to Alameda. What was that? How did that work? In other words, customers. I was a regular customer of FTX, but if Alameda wanted to do a transaction and mine, I was a lower priority then, right? And I never yeah. knew that Alameda had a higher priority than me in a trading lineup, you know, lineup. Yeah, of so trades. Alameda, Alameda traded on FTX. That was the platform they used to do all their different tradings and whatever, investments and all that. And they enjoyed some special privileges that were not revealed to the public or to investors or to anyone else. One of the big ones, and FTX was well known to have this risk management software where if you're trading on margin, like I talked about earlier, you would use some of your assets as collateral. And if your your trade was the price of whatever you were trading dipped too low, you were automatically liquidated. They would automatically sell your collateral and collect the cash and take it out of your account. So they to had this for the all loan, of their customers. To cover your margin, to cover your margin loan, right? To cover your margin. They had this right. for all their customers and Alameda was exempt. Alameda was the only customer that was allowed to have a negative balance on the FTX platform. And at some point, their balance reached negative billions. <laughs> yeah. And it actually did max out with what was coded, the max that was coded into it. And SBF apparently personally said, lower Explosion. that limit, lower that limit. So they can take out, you know, they can trade on more margin. Don't worry about liquidating them. In addition, their trades executed faster than anyone else on the platform. So they had direct access into the API so they could circumvent certain controls and whatever that allowed their trades to execute. It was really like fractions of a second faster than say what you and I could do. But right. in their world of high frequency trading, that is a massive advantage, believe it or not. And the CFTC in their charges actually highlighted that as being a really huge advantage that was completely unfair to anyone else trading on FTX. So a whole variety of little perks that they had on FTX that screwed over anyone else on that exchange. I wanna talk about the DOJ indictment came out on December 13th, which was pretty fast for a white collar case of such significance, even though everybody was aware of this and there was a lot of talk. And it was amazing to me that SBF was still talking and actually gave spoke at a, an event about this, knowing that he was going to get indicted. And we got a 14 page indictment charging him with conspiracy to commit wire fraud, wire fraud. I mean, everything you can think about conspiracy to commit commodities fraud. Now, the interesting thing about the SBF indictment is that it was just a listing of the charges. It was not a speaking indictment, as we call it in the parlance, where they list all the overt acts and you'd get a sense of all the evidence that they have. And it's clear to me that this was done relatively quickly. They wanted to get an arrest warrant, you know, had the 
grand jury indict him, get an arrest warrant based upon the indictment, and then grab him in the Bahamas, which is what they did. Which they did. (laughs) Yeah, which they did. And now the latest we've heard is he's waiving extradition, but he is, it's clear to me there are going to be other people charged. They're going to have a much more comprehensive indictment. I don't think they know the full you know, range and calculation here of everything that was done. You know, it was within one month they put this case together and they clearly had at least the cooperation of somebody from the inside. And yeah, they, I, I believe someone high up is cooperating and I'll speculate. <laughs> yeah, right. We were talking earlier. I, yeah. I think the Alameda CEO, Caroline Ellison, is cooperating. She was apparently spotted in New York recently, like a week or two ago. And there's no way she would have gotten into the country and not been arrested absent some kind of, you know, agreement with the government, with regulators. Because she is in the middle of all this as the CEO of Alameda. She's one of the few that knew of what was going on. There's three other names worth mentioning. Two executives at FTX, Nishad Singh and Gary Wang. They were two of the only others that knew of what was going on here. All the, you know, bad actions that we'll get into more a little bit later. And one other person, so up until maybe a week or two before FTX collapsed, there was a co-CEO at Alameda named Sam Trabuco, and he left kind of shockingly. It was a little bit surprising. It was pretty quick, and he just said, nope, I'm done. I'm going to retire right off into the sunset. It is believed that he actually then went to the Bahamas government, their regulators, and blew the whistle. So that may have been the first point where anyone knew something something was wrong. And so there could be two those are just rumors that, now, but Yeah, you could have two that? cooperators, you know, the CEO and that guy. But the other yeah. two I expect let's I mean, all five of those people are gonna be either charged or cooperating with plea agreements. Definitely. That's, if they're not cooperating, they're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we've also have a new CEO who came in and said, look, I've never seen anything like this, the absence of controls in a company this size. The amazing part about that is this new CEO is a bankruptcy attorney. This is what he does when, you know, these things go wrong. I think he works at Sullivan and Cromwell, maybe. When these companies go bankrupt, he comes in, he takes over and fixes things, pays off the debtors, whatever. He is the guy that came in to fix Enron after that debacle. And now he's into FTX and he says, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. (laughs) Well, that is amazing. Which is amazing. Right. Because I told you when I read the facts, I'm like, this is how SBF just reached in and just took whatever money he wanted, whenever he wanted it. And also you want to talk about the executives who were also buying houses. You could, I think it was like a $500, $500 million in loans given for real estate purposes. I mean, it's ridiculous. You want to talk about a lack of compliance controls. I mean, this company apparently did not even keep a list of its employees. So this guy comes in, takes over a CEO, and has no idea how many people even work for the company, whether as employees or contractors or otherwise. There's no central database of people that work there. They had zero controls over like expense reimbursements. Everything that they did went through Slack, which apparently auto-deletes after a certain time frame. So if they were reimbursing expenses, if they were giving bonuses, if they were giving personal loans to the different employees, it was all done through Slack. It was approved using emojis, and there are no records of it anywhere. <laughs> of who got what money at what point and for what reason. And then the other interesting thing, though, besides the public sort of perception of them as, you know, Larry David's commercial, all those commercials that ran during the Super Bowl, They were also giving money to the Democrat candidates, but then secretly doing so to the Republicans at the same time. Yeah, so they were buying their influence. And this is something the DOJ charged them with, the conspiracy to defraud the Federal Election Commission and commit campaign finance violations. SBF personally was one of the largest donors to the DNC, to the Biden campaign specifically, in the recent presidential election and funded a variety of other Democratic candidates publicly. And then it came out that he was also funding the right side of the aisle, just behind the scenes, using shell companies, going through different super PACs, 
doing it in a way that would not be known publicly because he wanted to look like he was this great hero, like democratic hero, right? But really it was, again, another fraud. It was all just to buy influence. Didn't matter who won. Whoever did win would have gotten a lot of money from him and ideally would have you know, helped him with whatever he needed at that point. So, And then we also have a bankruptcy proceeding, correct, going on with FTX. And they filed for bankruptcy yeah. here in the Bahamas, right? But, you know, they have some assets, but... You know, there's a yeah. lot of controversy now about information sharing from the bankruptcy proceeding that may ultimately end up in the United States. But we're only at the beginning, to me, of the litigation that's going to come. Oh, know? yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we have the the SEC, bankruptcy is, is one thing. They're yeah. trying to find if there's even money left over. They apparently actually today we're discussing this on the 20th of December. Today, they announced that they may have found an extra billion dollars hidden somewhere. So ideally, that'll go back to you know the users that lost funds, but they've not found enough to cover all losses. Losses on the exchange, users, user deposits specifically, the loss is at about $8 billion worth. So that's a lot of money from just like the average Joe and a lot of that coming from the United States, unfortunately. And the, so we also now have an SEC case. We have a CFTC case and... Now, those complaints are lengthy, and you can learn a lot of the facts of the case from that, mm -hmm. whereas the DOJ indictment is sort of just a quick hit and will eventually get into all the details. But we now we're some also funny stuff, like, since this point. I mean, that, you know, I don't even know if this wasn't even in the complaint. It just came out recently. But apparently SBF and a couple of those other executives we talked about earlier – communicated with each other with a telegram group and the telegram group was nicknamed wire fraud. <laughs> I, I saw that as well, so. <laughs> that they nicknamed themselves as wire fraud. It was unbelievable. Right. But now, so, you know, whether that was a joke or whether or not they were just poking fun at the illicit things they were doing. I mean, it's just obviously a bad look now <laughs> with yeah, all that's come out. It's incredible. I think we're sort of at the beginning of learning about a whole bunch of crazy things that was going on. You have to wonder where else the money went, right? Like we just learned that they were funding some, you know, U.S. candidates through shell companies and the like. So what other candidates around the world maybe were they funding? Or who knows? I mean, they had billions of dollars to play with. and You could do a lot of bad things with that kind of money with no oversight. So it's going to get it's going to get much worse before it gets any better. So now the the real issue is politically, this whole travesty is Already, I've seen calls in Congress to pass legislation now to, quote unquote, regulate cryptocurrency. Gary Gensler has been the head of the SEC. Is it going to be in the hot seat, especially when the Republicans get into power in January, about what did he do? What did he know? Why didn't they do more about this issue to avoid this kind of calamity? And then, you know, we're going to get to the difficult issue that's been debated for a long time, Matt, which is what kind of regulation if there should be. Is cryptocurrency basically a security for purposes of the SEC's Securities Act, or is it a commodity for purposes of CFTC regulation? I mean, how do you see all of those issues? And, you know, it's hard to keep a scorecard here of where things are going, but to me, there are going to be some big industry issues that are dealt with as a result of this. Yeah, so the regulation piece is interesting. And, you know, you and I have been debating this for the last couple of days. And your first reaction, right, was we need to regulate this stuff. I mean, this is getting exactly. outrageous and people are getting hurt. Right. That said, it is already regulated. You and I, we've done work with different exchanges and, you know, different clients where we explain like this is the AML controls you need. This is how you set up a KYC process. Let's talk about sanctions. This is what you need to look out for. This is what you need to do and things right. like that. So they're already regulated. One of the biggest issues is that there's very little clarity or guidance from a lot of the regulators. And this is my biggest issue with the SEC and you know, Chairman Gensler in particular. And this is a very common criticism from the industry is that he is using the SEC right now to regulate by enforcement. And the industry has been desperately requesting guidance on what makes a cryptocurrency, what makes a virtual asset a security. Because right now we have the Howey test, which dealt with what an interest in an orange grove back in the day. 
and it just doesn't fit with this new technology. There's virtually no guidance on how to determine what your protocol or your, you know, your currency can do and cannot do. It's pushed a lot of these exchanges offshore and offshore to jurisdictions where there's less transparency, less regulations, and less risk of enforcement. And because of that, I think you get situations like this because if you're located in the Bahamas, I mean, they're just not known for their financial transparency, right? Like I hate to throw shade at the wonderful islands, but it's just the truth. And had they been headquartered in the U.S., yeah, maybe this doesn't happen. Had they had that regulatory clarity, maybe they don't get to this point. And it is a shame because you do have a lot of exchanges that are trying their best to comply. You know, you could look at Coinbase. I think Coinbase is known for its compliance efforts in the industry. And I think there's a reason why, despite how big they are, they've not been able to reach the status of FTX or Binance. And it's because a lot of the regulations are preventing them from doing the things that would get them there. Instead, you've got FTX in the Bahamas. You've got Binance now operating out of Malta, originally based in China, I believe. And when they didn't really have to answer to anyone, they could do whatever they wanted. And that usually meant a lot of shady things, unfortunately. And I don't mean to bring Binance into this. And they have their own issues right now, allegedly, but they're still solvent as far, far as I know. But who knows? But I think see, we Matt, do need more clarity. Yeah, but the thing about it is you make a really interesting point, which is when you drive companies offshore, that raises risks. And, I mean, let's go back to even an elementary point about FCPA. People have said, and you've noticed some companies that have delisted off of the U.S. exchanges because of the costs and the risks of regulation and the exposure for FCPA purposes, right, to your books and records and all of that. And what you're saying is two points. One is that, first off, you can't regulate through enforcement, particularly when we have clients or potential clients or people we've worked with who have gone into the SEC to ask them questions to try to work with them when they were talking about ICOs. So there's a real feeling from the industry that we need some guidance here. Give us some guidance and we can debate some of the issues. At the same time, we have this real danger of offshore companies or offshore operations where they try to exclude U.S. customers, which raises a whole big issue of compliance. Plus, some of these companies, you can't go into a new business like this and exclude the U.S. marketplace. I mean, it's just crazy. You're not getting any revenue. I I still remember we had a startup exchange come to us and ask about sanctions compliance specifically. And, you know, we gave them some basic controls like, hey, you guys got to have at least this in place or you're just asking for trouble. No, and they explained to us, like, hey, like, our competitors are offshore and they're not doing this. And if we do this, we can't compete with them and we can't afford it. So what are we supposed to do? That's the issue right now. So then what do you do? Go offshore and ignore the regulations? But then you lose access to a huge market. And to me, look, I think in the end, a company like Coinbase or a company that wants to get the benefits doesn't go for the greed up front but builds a real compliance program. And I'm talking about a real one, which is obviously we're not pitching that to all of our listeners right now, but (laughs) that's what we do. But I think in the long run, those companies, because they have a culture of compliance that starts from the beginning, in the end can be more successful than, you know, these fly-by-nights or look at SBF. I mean, he just ignored everything. And they set up in the Bahamas for an obvious reason. You know, when I call for regulatory clarity, I mean, this reminds me of some of the things that we tell some of our clients in the compliance space. We have clients come to us and they say like, oh, like it's so frustrating to work with our salespeople or operations. Like they're just cowboys and they're always going off and doing crazy things. And we tell them, it's like, look, they don't like me because I always have to say no to everything that they ask. And we always tell them, look, like if you can give them a sandbox to operate in, just basic, like these are the boundaries you can go up against. Just don't pass that. and. Just don't step over those lines and we'll, we'll be fine. That makes the sales staff, the operations staff happy. So that is what needs to be in place here when I say regulatory clarity. Give those boundaries. What is a security? It is X, Y, and Z. And anything over this line or that line is no good. And 
the industry is happy. <laughs> they don't need to do these crazy things that FTX was doing, apparently. There are a lot of good companies that want to comply and want to do so, but want to be profitable and give them a way to do that and will help a ton of things. <laughs> But I think also you make a really good point, too, and we've seen this before, but um, Matt, which is mm -hmm. regulation by enforcement is not fair because then you and right. I sit there and go through an enforcement action and try to read the tea leaves, and then they have to be consistent in each case. And we did that in the early days of the FCPA, you know, in the last, not the early days of it, but I mean the early days of ramped up. Uh, aggressive enforcement, which I put mm -hmm. more in like the 2010 time period, we would scrub those things for any little nuance. And it seems right. to me like that's not fair to the industry. And particularly because it's a cutting edge type of technology that can go in various, you know, directions. It seems to me like we need to have consistent rules that are clearly delineated communicated, and then the industry starts to operate by. But I think that the SBF debacle, I think, is going to set back the industry plus its ability, Definitely. its regulatory standing, and its trust with customers now. This is a massive black eye for the industry. Like I said, up until its collapse, everyone thought SBF was the golden boy and FTX was the golden standard for what a cryptocurrency exchange should be. And, yeah, that's how we started this podcast, just completely blindsided by this unbridled rampant fraud. I mean, it, it just it shocks me even today. And it's, it just still hasn't sunk in <laughs> how yeah. ridiculous these allegations are. And to me, the jail time that these folks are going to be looking at, given the amount of money here and what I haven't seen or haven't seen as much reporting on is where are all the victims? When Bernie Madoff got caught, there were plenty of victims up there complaining about how much money they had lost, high fluting people from wherever, various institutions that had lost money. Where are all the victims there? The U.S. has to have a large number of victims. You know, there's a lot of investors that lost money, but those guys are wealthy. They're going to be fine. I mean, even some of the crypto hedge funds that lost like, you know, $100 million, they wrote it off and they're going about their business. The biggest issue here is there were hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of small time investors that just wanted to dip their toes into the cryptocurrency world that got burnt pretty hard. And we're not going to know the extent of that until, you know, a little further in the bankruptcy proceedings once that information comes out. But it's probably going to be a staggering amount. And yeah, it's going to be just a lot of normal people, relatively young, I would say too, that probably lost, you know, life savings in this, unfortunately. Like we said, this one, massive there, black eye for the industry. And I can't remember the individual's name, but there was one investor who gave millions and millions of dollars to SBF as an initial investor who apparently has mm -hmm. lost all of his money. Okay. I'm talking about yeah. in the hundreds of millions of a guy who invested and now has nothing. He'll have a claim in bankruptcy, but what's right. that worth? <laughs> you talk about just some rampant criminal behavior. And SBF was treading water trying to stay afloat, but he just hurt so many people along the way. That's amazing. You know, it's wild. And I don't even know if, well, yeah, we won't even get into this issue now, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of big investors that are still kind of coming to terms with their loss too. You guys may know a big guy from Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary. Um, yeah. He's a big investor. He was actually a paid spokesman for FTX. FTX apparently paid him $15 million out of user funds, <laughs> allegedly. Kevin O'Leary is still in front of Congress. He's still on TV right now giving interviews saying like, hey, you know, I think he just made a mistake, right? Like still hasn't come to terms with what actually happened. And I do believe, I mean, just again, with how highly regarded SBF was in the industry, if he's not sitting in jail for the rest of his life, he'll still find people willing to give him money for whatever new venture he starts up next, which is outrageous to me, but that's just the persona that he has and arguably still has to a lot of these people. That's the psychology of a white collar criminal. I mean, a sociopath yeah. in the end. And I've always right. said that these are dangerous people because they can convince so many innocent people to give away assets, money, savings, resources, whatever. And they don't feel guilt. I don't think uh, no. SPF is 
probably he'll figure out a way that he was wrong or he was I, in this process. I was going to say, I think he sees himself as a victim here. I don't think he sees himself as having done anything wrong yet. Which is incredible. Matt, uh, it's always good to have you on, catch up on this. Let's stay on top of this case. I think it's going to be fascinating because we're oh, yeah. going to learn more and more. There may be valuable lessons learned beyond, hey, an absence of controls and a lot of money is not a good, it's not a good mix. <laughs> okay. Plus, when you have a sociopath. I bet it was top, fun for a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. But in the end, the consequences aren't the way to go. And frankly, Mark my words, this may be, and I may regret this, this may be a reminder that what I was saying about Coinbase, and I don't, I'm don't, i not promoting Coinbase or anything like that, but that companies that grow responsibly with controls in place in the end are going to succeed in the marketplace better. I, Coinbase couldn't become I as agree. big as SBF, but they're not in bankruptcy right now. They're not suffering. They couldn't grow as fast. They couldn't take that rocket ship up. And they've been doing fine, obviously. Growth has been crazy for them. But they couldn't take that crazy rocket ship that SBF enjoyed because they wanted to do things the right way. So in doing so, they're going to enjoy some slower growth, but they'll be just fine throughout all this. I will say real quick for the industry, one of the benefits of cryptocurrency, which could have prevented a lot of this, is the fact that you can self-custody your assets. You do not need to use a middleman. Really like the biggest aspect of cryptocurrency that really why it was created in the first place is that you don't need an intermediary to transact with. But and even the when, you know, earlier I said you the banks, you get people, you have a, a right. blockchain that everybody can have access to it. It's public and the ledger is there and there's a record right. of it. I don't need the third party. I can send you Bitcoin. While everyone is you know coming after the industry now, calling for its head, keep in mind that this is the reason why cryptocurrency was invented, to get rid of these bad actors in the middle, right? Like we see issues with banks. Wells Fargo just got into more issues. Right. Deutsche Bank's always having issues. Right. What if we just didn't have those intermediaries? And that's really the soul and the heart of cryptocurrency. Well, that is, and even that myself, is, yeah. even, even myself, <laughs> like I said, I lost some assets in this. The majority yeah. of my holdings are just fine because I self-custody. So no one else is responsible other than myself. There's no other bad actor that I have to rely on to behold these things. So well, I that's think that's really great. what saved me here. That, that is a really great point because to me that underscores what blockchain, what the value of the technology was from the beginning. And you're right. It doesn't need third parties ladled on top of it to, they were supposed to be competitors by getting rid of banks, getting rid of the middleman right. or the person. So you don't lose money that, you know, you get the full value of your so currency. So SBF I, can't dip into your funds to buy exactly. lavish real estate in the Bahamas. <laughs> but then we also get to the point that the technology itself is revolutionary. And I hope that the technology is not defeated or ignored because of these bad actors who have nothing to right. do with the technology itself, but just with being right. bad people. That's it. Yep. So that just charlatans. Yeah, that's a great point. And self-custody is the angle here. But I'm just worried that the political and media mess that has been created by this is going to mean all the gains that the industry had made over the last 10 years or let's say are now almost mm -hmm. like lost because of this. I really fear that. Oh, yeah. That's the one fear. You know, they can't. Big step back, unfortunately. But like I said, this issue really only underscores the value of the technology. So hopefully yeah, great that's point. realized. <laughs> yeah, no, great point. Great but point. We'll see. No, and We've got so a that we, to go. you know, yeah, we, we always will have, you know, the criminals, the white collar criminals, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has nothing to do here with the technology of what occurred. That's great. All right, Matt, we'll be back in touch with you for sure as SBF's trial day comes up. No, I mean, <laughs> as whatever, <laughs> he will not go to trial. Trust me, this will not go to trial. But he may spend a long, long period of time, if not the rest of his life, in jail. And I think when yeah. the full story comes out, it may be well-deserved, given what at least the headlines look like right now. So thanks again, Matt. Be back Definitely. in touch. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. If you enjoyed this episode, the best way to support the show is by subscribing on your favorite listening platform. 
To learn more and connect with Michael Volkov, go to volkovlaw.com.